If God did not want Satan to exist, to touch you, period, to even be there, to threaten you, Satan would not exist, period. I want you to think of something. God is the one that permits Satan to operate until he is put out of the way, period. So if God allows these negative entities and Satan to operate, it's for a reason. One of those reasons is that if you ever go on the wrong side of the fence, you're going to get torn to pieces. Often we begin on the wrong side of the fence and we're called into the light. During that time, we were on the wrong side of the fence. Most of the damage was done. And then some damage is purpose to motivate others, so on and so forth. But Satan wants us. He tries, especially if you're serving the Lord. If any of you teach to anybody else, Satan will often cut off every avenue that you have, right? Now, the Lord permits this. Why? Because we always say one thing, Lord, I want to serve you. That's what we say. We talk to the Lord and we say, Lord, I want to serve you. Lord, I don't care what it takes. I'm going to serve you. Well, everything you speak is going to be qualified. If you go making statements like that, whether it be in public or private, that statement has to be qualified because the Lord does not like hypocrites. And if he doesn't like hypocrites, he's going to qualify our statements. And whenever we say we want to serve the Lord, like me in this capacity, right? Which means under great duress, that's when the question is asked. Will you serve me? The Lord's not going to ask you, are you going to serve him when you're at your best? When everything is going easy and everything else, no. The storm comes. It strips you bare and clean. And then the Lord says, will you serve me faithfully anyway? Should you say yes, then things change. You go to another level. Now, I've been asked this question multiple times. Will I really serve the Lord in any condition, any circumstance, any situation? I'm telling you right now, those conditions, circumstances, and situations compounded themselves enough to uh, obliterate my weekend plans with you guys. But know this, the Lord is ultimately asking me a question in great duress. Will I still serve him? See, because times come and whenever the Lord works with me this way, trust me, there's something on the other side where it will be required. And uh, that could mean you know, my life could take an abrupt dip. And in those moments, the question will be, will I still serve him no matter what? My answer is yes. I'm just telling you that right now. So Satan has a habit of cutting off your avenues of life itself. He'll make a situation look really bad. In other words, it'll look like uh, you're really personally in your personal life, like you're about to fold up, like nothing is working out and you're really about to fold up. And then in those moments, you start thinking, well, I've got to do so-and-so now. Well, I can't do this. I have to do this. If you go altering things out of fear, you're messing up already. So don't alter anything. Seek the Lord even the more. Do you know why? Because there's always a blessing. When Satan confronts you like this, he only does that because the Lord is looking directly at you. If the Lord looks or protects anybody, it draws the attention of Satan. And if the Lord is about to place a hedge around you or, or bless you in a certain capacity, Satan will often attack you first to get you to void his protection, his way, his path in your life, to get you to say no so that you won't be blessed. But if you stay your course, no matter what it looks like, the Lord will always come through. Now, listen to me carefully. It's going to look bad all the time. I'm sure that the wilderness looked hopeless. Every day, I bet you they said, is this the day we're going to be out of the wilderness? Can you imagine doing that for 40 years? Am I going to be delivered today? And then you're not. How depressing would that be? So you have to learn to live day by day, not month by month, not week by week, but day by day. Now, I'm not a newbie in this area. I've experienced in this area, but often you're going to be challenged like that right before the promotion. I'm going to call that God's promotion right before he promotes you to a higher level of doing things. Because remember, he has to entrust you with young souls. Do you know that? He will entrust his children who carry the gospel with young souls. He will not entrust a novice with the soul of anybody. He's not going to do it. For many of you, he'll grant platforms, but you have to have great responsibility and commitment before he gives you a platform. I'm not talking about a platform that you make yourself, but listen, if you keep your eyes upon Christ, no matter what your health condition is, no matter what your path looks like, you keep your eyes on Christ, make your life about his business. That's key. That is the key right there. Make your life about his business. Now, we all say it. We all say, Lord, I want to serve 
serve you, but is our life about his business? All too often, we're trying to serve him, but have our life the way we want it too. I can tell you right now, for some of you, that's not going to work, and that's not the way. You've got to make your life about his business. It takes a total commitment. The more opposition you have, the more of a commitment you have to give, because Satan will assault you, and he'll attempt to, and the Lord allows this to happen, because the Lord is constantly asking, will you serve me under any conditions? Can I trust you with my gospel? You, you guys remember Peter? He said, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you. Well, feed my sheep. Then he said it again, Peter. Yes, Lord, do you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you. Well, then feed my sheep. Then he said a third time, Peter, do you love me? At this time, you know Peter was kind of hurt. Like, why is the Lord questioning my love for him? But he kept saying, if you love me, feed my sheep. In other words, no matter what you go through, no matter what transpires in your life, feed my sheep. And in order to feed the sheep of the Lord, you can you cannot feed them puppy chow. You can't feed them anything other than the Word of God. And in order to feed them the Word of God, you've got to be a vessel of usage for the Word of God, which means you can never come out of character. There is no going back to being yourself or saying, well, I just need some me time. There, there's none of that. You're a servant of the Lord. It's time to live as royalty. You have to realize you're in this world, not of this world. You're going to be prone to every condition everybody else is going through, but you yourselves have to have a mind commitment towards Christ. You can't have it in your heart to look back. People have told you, well, you're only human. You're going to make mistakes. Stop living by those foolish and condemning statements. All that does is weaken you and give you an avenue of escape out of servitude. And by the way, that avenue of escape out of servitude is back into Sodom and Gomorrah. So commit yourselves. Make this thing for real. Have that real commitment within yourself. Don't say a word to the Lord, but speak to your own souls saying, listen, are we going to do this or not? Because in my life, it's either go forward or die. That's just how it is. There is no going back. There's no going sideways. There's no taking a pause, taking a rest, vacation. I need to think. Let me get away for a while. None of that. I'm often pulled away through things that I do not share with you guys. But I'm telling you, Satan's assaults. Yes, they're real, but they don't have to slow you down. Do you guys understand me? It's supposed to be that way. It's designed to be that way. If you were going to test the resolve of somebody and say, let me see if this person is going to be a good employee. One of the first things I do is say, well, you know, I can't pay you that much. That'd be the first thing I say. Do you know why? Because if a person loves the company, if they like the company, they're willing to fight for that company. To be honest with you, they're not concerned about how much they get paid. Naturally, they're going to have to get paid. They don't care how much. They're in it for the company. So you find out what a person is in it for when you limit what they receive. That's exactly what the Lord does in our lives. He will limit you on what you receive to see what you're in it for. But he already knows. The problem is we don't know. We deceive ourselves. We'll say, no, I'm in this, you know, heart and soul. But the truth is we're not. And so when the Lord begins to limit us on certain things, I mean, Satan will put all sorts of thoughts in your mind. Listen, you're going to deal with stresses and everything else, but those things are of the body. If they're not of the spirit, do you understand? Your stresses of this life, all that's of the body in the carnal mind, it is not of the spirit. In the body and mind, do I have stresses? You better believe it. Heavy weights? Yes, I have those things. But of the spirit, there, there are no weights. There's no pressure. There's none of that. There are only decisions. There's only the resolve of following Christ more efficiently and effectively and truthfully. That's what's of the spirit, growing spiritually. In the flesh, you may think about everything, but you have to learn to master your flesh. You remember when God in the beginning told Cain, he said, you must master sin. In other words, don't let sin dictate your life, but you overcome your own body that sin cannot find placement. See how that works? Every single individual on the face of the earth is a victim of mind control. Let me show you how. Everything you ever want to be is designed by somebody else. You're emulating somebody else's success. You're working within a system where all the rooms are already made. So the best that you can be is something somebody else established. That's the best. Now, in my case, I understand that there's flesh, there's the spirit. I live in this world by way of the flesh. My spirit will be free one day. But what I must continue to do is walk after those spiritual things and take the flesh and command it. I can't let the flesh command me. I must command the flesh. The flesh is here to serve that mind of the spirit in me. Why is that? Because when you have a born again spirit, you instantly turn against those things of the flesh. You don't even contemplate them anymore, nor you're drawn to any flesh type thing in this world. And you're just not. You're changed. But that comes step by step by step. 
You guys ready for this? Matthew 15, you ready? Here it is. Matthew 15, 10. And he called the multitude and said unto them, Hear and understand. Not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the mouth, this defiles a man. Then came his disciples and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended after they heard this saying? But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. Let them alone. They that be blind leaders of the blind, and if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. The disciples came and said, Don't you know they're offended by these sayings? Jesus said, Let them alone. Because every plant which my heavenly Father did not plant is going to be rooted up. Everything planted on this earth, I'm talking about people, situations, circumstances, systems, governments, whatever the case is, everything that's been established on the earth that the Father did not establish is going to be rooted up. Every person that carries around an ideology, God did not give us that ideology, is going to be rooted up. Everything is going to be rooted up that God did not plan. So Jesus said, well, okay, don't do anything about that. Because what the Pharisees were doing was this backbiting and all these things. They were letting Jesus know, hey, hey, Jesus, these guys were out for you. Jesus said, well, let them alone. In other words, let them be out for me. Then. Leave them alone. Because God did not plant what they're displaying in their hearts. God didn't plant the ideology they have in their minds. It will be rooted up. He said, let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. Because God did not establish what they carry. God didn't establish what they're teaching. Teaching hatred, teaching to pursue people who have false this, and God didn't teach any of that. God taught mercy, forgiveness. God taught some things, but they were doing things God did not teach. And he said, everything, every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted shall be rooted up. He said, let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both are going to fall into the ditch. In other words, both are going to be uprooted. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, declare unto us this parable, and Jesus said, are ye also without understanding? Do not ye yet understand that whatsoever entereth into the mouth goeth into the belly, and is cast out into the draught? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile a man. Because they were talking about unclean stuff, eating, you know, and all this stuff, traditions. So he said, for out of the heart proceedeth evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false, false witness, blasphemies. These are things which defile a a man, but to eat with unwashed hands defileth not a man. This is a big lesson for all of us. You see what he said at the end, Matthew 15, 20? He said to eat with unwashed hands, that does not defile you. See, above that though, the Pharisees were offended because they were talking about, you know, being clean on the outside and what you consume after the manner of the law, this, that, and the other. And that's where their focus was. They were so concerned about the law and the appearance of the law and the appearance of keeping all those things that they had lost their mercy. They had lost their spiritual connection to truth. They could only see fault finding the law. They could only see what a person was breaking. They could not see what a person was keeping. They could only see what they were breaking. As a result of that, they changed and they became came fault finders looking at everything people were doing wrong. Let me tell you something. If that's all you see is what people are doing wrong, something is going on with your heart that shouldn't. I'm in this earth. You're in this earth. We know that the flesh is full of sin. We know that the earth is full of sin. You don't have to look for it. It exists everywhere, even in you. But if you're looking for something, you're surely going to find it. And those who find fault with everybody, that's what they look for. And something is wrong with their hearts. If they go forward with that teaching with a corrupt heart, that is the blind leading the blind. Do you guys see that? Their hearts were corrupted. That's why Jesus was talking about what comes out of the mouth proceeded forth from the heart. Murders and sins and adulteries and all those, they proceed out of the heart. That defiles a man. Both those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart. They defile a man. For out of the heart proceedeth evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, and blasphemies. All these are conjured up in the heart. And then what do they do? When they manifest... You begin to do them or speak about them, and that defiles a person. And he was teaching people about the Pharisees. What was in them was coming out regardless. And they were saying, well, look, these corrupt people are seeking to, you know, they're, they're, they're targeting you, Jesus, and let them alone. And let all those they teach alone. Because if people listen, in order for you to accept some hateful speech out there, then in your heart is hate. You will accept what you're looking for. That's what you're going to accept. If you sit there and you buy the lie, 
You wanted that lie. You were hoping for that lie. That's why we believe in things, because we desire those things. Do you guys see that? What you desire is what you end up believing in fully. And based upon that, you can be tricked. You can be deceived. But guess what? If you're looking for the truth of Christ, how then can you be deceived? You're not looking for miracles. You're not looking for a person to prove himself. To look for Christ within yourself is to look for the manifestation of holiness. And at that manifestation of holiness, you can't trick that. It doesn't matter if a person's working miracles. That does not qualify a person as being holy. But when that holiness manifesting you by way of conviction, for example, if I were looking at a person, I said, look at that person. It's just ridiculous. If I instantly had conviction over that. Now that is holiness. Because the Lord does not require that from any of us, nor did he ever teach that. In fact, he spoke against it. So if it rises up in me and convicts me, that's holiness. If somebody comes along and says, yeah, you know, I can perceive what you're thinking and quote exactly what I was thinking and come alongside me and accuse that person, that's not holiness. That's from a trickster. God doesn't teach violence. God doesn't teach hate. God doesn't teach all this division nonsense. God doesn't teach those things. God is a God of reconciliation. Didn't he send John the Baptist to turn the hearts of the children back into the Father? Yes, he did. Didn't Jesus make a way so that we could be forgiven of all of our sins and stand with the Father and fully be delivered? Yes, he did. Didn't he sacrifice his life out of mercy for people who did not even deserve it? Yes, he did. And if he sacrificed his life for people that didn't deserve it, wouldn't that be a God of mercy running the whole show? Yes, it is. A God of love and mercy. That means much forgiveness. That means if a person offend you or sin against you, forgive the person. That means you got to stand ready to forgive a person, not convict a person. Yes, they do terrible things, but so have we. In the eyes of God, how terrible is it to tell a small lie? That's just as bad as murdering someone. You don't know the cause and the effect. Now, one is, one is, is, is on the same plane as the other. It's all of its iniquity. And in the eyes of God, it's all wrong. So why would a person accuse another? Why would I point the flaws out in another person? To point the flaw out in another person and voice that is doing what? throwing a person under the bus because it surely isn't helping someone it surely isn't going to the person to have them consider what they did because if you want somebody to consider what they have done you've got to be in relationship with them you've got to know them you've got to talk to them on a different level the lord teaches different ways than the world so the lord said you know if these people are out there that's the blind leading the blind in other words blind people follow blind leaders and both fall into the ditch what do you see in the world a lot of hatred a lot of justified murder. That's what you see. A lot of adultery and fornication and everything else. You see it. You see it, don't you? You see it also support it. It's part of our society. It doesn't mean you have to be a part of it. The world has fallen to iniquity. And we have standards of our fathers. So when you're watching television or looking at the internet and some weird ad comes up, which nobody sees anything wrong with it, but it's immoral to you and you flip off of it, that's conviction. And when you act upon that conviction, it's almost like you, you have an embrace. But if you let it slide, if you do that one time too many, you'll think it's okay. You'll say, there's nothing wrong with that. When in truth it is, you'll start slipping because you're rejecting conviction. The Lord gives us conviction all the time against things we do. We don't always act upon it, but he gives it to us. And that internal change, that you become a forgiving person, an humble person, a meek person, no longer aggressive, no longer hateful, no longer pointing at everybody, no longer wanting everybody to be crucified and hung and sit in the electric chair. When you relent from those areas of life, that's holiness. That's the establishment of Christ in us. We're not afraid anymore. It's because the king that's over your life is over fear itself. See, when you have Christ in your life, how can one have fear and Christ at the same time? I submit to you right now, if you start thinking about Christ in a fearful situation, all your fears begin to leave. That's one of my secrets. Do I have to contend with fear? Yep. But you know what I do? I remember that moment and encourage my soul that Jesus is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And he came to save me, not to subject me to something that would torture me like the movies will teach you and books will teach you and men's lifestyles will teach you. He didn't come to establish those things in your life, but deliverance. That means everything in your life is purposed because you believe in Christ. But if you don't believe in Christ and you believe in man's words above your Lord's, you're going to have a fractured mind. If you go teaching 
with a fractured mind, you're teaching a fractured doctrine to somebody else. You're corrupt. That's the blind leading the blind. So then the first stage is to accept change within yourself from the Messiah, depart from mankind's teachings. Now, it doesn't mean just totally throw away everything of mankind, because I submit to you right now, God established many things in mankind, but he did not establish man's greed. He did not establish man's hatred. He did not establish revenge and man's vindictive behavior. He didn't establish those things within mankind. The Lord told his own people, you must learn to do good. That means they began doing evil. He told Cain, you must master sin. He gave a word through the apostles, something similar to all of us, to anybody that would read the New Testament. You have to learn to do good and shun evil. Seek the ways of mercy. Seek the ways of forgiveness. Seek the ways of meekness. Seek the ways of humility. Understand what those things are. They're keystones in your path in this life. And realize what the truth is. Satan is always trying to assault, to destroy, to kill you. But he has no permission to. So often he harasses you. He causes a situation to look a specific way. And, and guess what? Anybody who is not bound in Christ can be utilized of Satan. So don't be surprised if your best friend comes to you with and matches the satanic accusations that came from somewhere else. Don't be surprised. Because if a person is not in Christ at that moment, they can be used by the devil. Any one of you at a moment of weakness can be utilized by Satan. And what I mean by that, when you have these ideas of giving up and throwing in the towel, you can be utilized by Satan. That's why the Lord said, the Lord said, he that endures until the end, the same shall be saved. Not those who give up. So continue to run this race. Don't think of giving up, but think of your commitment to Christ being even stronger, no matter what happens, no matter what it looks like, no matter how people interpret it, you are going to answer to the Most High. You're not going to answer to people. Do right in the eyes of the Lord. Let that be your primary function. And I'll tell you something, the righteous will always notice you. See, this is something we have to do. We have to choose this. We're not going to be forced into it. You're going to have to choose it. You're going to have to choose good over evil. Now, to know this means you don't waste your time trying to tell them, go seek out these Pharisee type people in today's world who would who would teach violence and all. Stop seeking those things out, but lift up the name of the Lord. You don't know this, but you're an influencer. Everything you do in your life matters because no matter if you know them or not, they're going to see, emulate, copy, talk about, whether in persecution or in support of. Something about you has gone out to other people. Here's a key. What did you demonstrate to them? I can say this. I'm very careful to consider that everywhere I am with every word I say. And sometimes I have foot and mouth disease. You know what that means? That means if my passion takes over too much and I throw caution to the wind in that passion, I'm the one in the wrong. Nobody else is. So you have to be aware of these things. You're in this world, not of this world. You're a representative of the kingdom of God. If you believe in Christ, you're a child of the living God and people are looking at you. So now that you know they're going to look at you, they're going to talk about you, they're going to emulate certain things that you do, never, they will never give you the credit. Understand that you're influencing people. You're giving them a go or no go and how they live their lives according to righteousness. You are the representative of that. So when you're about to throw caution to the wind and have a meltdown, remember that somebody's watching you and you could be giving somebody permission to do that same thing. And do you really think your king, your lord of lords, would be pleased with that? And is that really what you want to do? Because I don't think that intentionally any of you want to spread any type of dissidence or any type of evil or anger or anything else. You wouldn't purposely do that. It's just that sometimes we believe the words of Satan that nobody's seeing us, that nobody knows us, that nobody's listening, that nobody's, you know, nobody's observing. And all those are contrary to what the Lord said. The Lord said they will always see you. The Lord said, you have an audience around you. You may not even know it. So you had to watch what you do to make sure it's in line with the kingdom. And an authentic heart towards Christ produces these outward things that we do, and they'll be in line with righteousness. So give your heart a check and encourage your own soul and remind yourself why you're here. Do it every day if you have to. Remind yourself that you did not begin your own faith, but God put that faith in you so that you could be given to his son. That means you believe so that you can be kept, not condemned. It doesn't matter how short you fell, how much of a target you missed, how much of your walk you scuttled. Get right back up again and follow Christ in a newness with a committed heart. No matter what it looks like, you're going to walk through snow. You're going to walk through blizzards. You're going to walk through rain. You're going to walk through hurricanes. You're going to walk through dry seasons. You're going to walk through all seasons. So what? Walk through them and know that you're walking 
with the Lord right there. He's right there all around you, beside you, on top of you, in you. He's everywhere around you. You'll never be absent the Lord. You're never alone. Don't believe that lie from Satan telling you that you're alone. Because if you start thinking about your aloneness and what you don't have, all of a sudden that enters into the heart. Don't you know that what enters into the heart is what you have debated about in the mind? You let things into your heart. You start contemplating it, believing by weight of measure, proof, whatever the case is, it's going to flow right down to your heart. And then once it's in your heart, it grows. And eventually it comes out either by action or by your words, but it comes out. So let me share this. Not one person in the house of God can judge your life. Not one person. All of us have missed the mark. And when Jesus died on the cross, he did it for real. He died for such. He did not come for those who were okay. He came for those of whom he needed to pay the price for. Because God commanded his love towards us. That means no matter how bad the act was, he came for such. And when you have a repentant heart to see the depth of what we have done, when a person realizes what they have been and what they have done, that is beautiful, not ugly. That's beautiful. That's a repentant heart. That's a truthful heart. All of us have done that same thing. And Jesus paid the price in full. You're bought with a price, which means all of what you just disclosed, your prayer. The last part he won't commit to because he died for you. Do we deserve to go to heaven? No, we don't. Do we deserve any good thing in life? No, we do not. We deserve death a thousand times over, the truth be told. All of us have played a role in corrupting somebody else's life. All of us have had thoughts of iniquity against just about a lot of people. All of us have had thoughts of murder. Because if you have ever had anger against a person, that's the same as murder. All of us have had these things. And none of us could get beyond them. See, once committing them, we're guilty of breaking the law in some capacity. Jesus came for such. And when he died on the cross, he did so for all of us individually and collectively. And he paid the price in full, descending into shield. He now has the keys of hell, death, and the grave. He commands such things. And he rose again. You know what that means? That means no matter how far you fall, you can't fall lower than hell itself. Upon that recognition of yourself, of what you have committed throughout your lives. And to have that heart of repentance means you realize you messed up big time. All of us did. So this day, stand up, knowing he paid the price in full, and simply say, yes, I accept that cross for real. I accept that sacrifice for real. And I tell you what, with that repentant heart, he is faithful, and your sins are forgiven you, and today is a brand new day. One of the gifts of salvation is that today can be a brand new day. So embrace it. He's not going to cast you aside. He's not going to throw you in the pit, because he died so that you won't have to go there. You have no placement in the pit. Every human being that's on this earth has been beguiled to a degree. He already knows that. So a sacrifice was sent because we were born into iniquity. He died on that cross that we may be carried out of that womb and that death and that grave of iniquity into a brand new place. But recognition of just how rotten we really are is called a repentant heart. That's the beginning of truth. When we see what we have done, when we stop the bragging, when we cease from elevating ourselves and we just simply say, I'm not worthy of any of this. I'm worse than anybody knows. That's a repentant heart. That's the beginning of truth. That's how it begins. That's the truth of how it begins. That's what Paul went through. That's what Peter recognized. They saw themselves in truth and they said, thank you, Lord. They said, I accept it. I accept the forgiveness, knowing that you never have to go back to that lifestyle again. But also know that if you fall to the left or to the right, he is just to pick you up again. Keep that repentant heart. Never forget who the old man was. Because the promise of a new spirit, a born-again spirit, is on all who accept the gift that was given at the cross. Jesus was the last sacrifice. There is no other sacrifice worthy to even be called a sacrifice. Jesus was the last sacrifice. And his blood spilled. And he endured the pain for all of our iniquities. And it is real. If it weren't real, you wouldn't have the conviction. That conviction comes from the Spirit. And by the Spirit, a newness happens. Except his sacrifice at the cross. It's that simple. The Lord does all the complicated things. It's our choice to accept his sacrifice or not. But you couldn't repent if you weren't his. You wouldn't even know Christ if you weren't his, and you wouldn't condemn yourself if you were not his. So now you know who you belong to, for real.
So stand up, because no one in this house can judge your life. You're in the fold. It is the Lord who brings conviction. He is the one that causes us to remember, to be reminded of what we were, to bring us to that point of repentance in the first place. We don't do that. He does that. Isn't that awesome? You belong to him. All of us could admit we've been actors in this world. And when we portray one character and it doesn't work out, we simply switch to another. All of us have done that to a degree. But by the truth of our Father, we don't have to do that another day. Man will always point out your guilt and your errors. Your Father's not interested in your errors nor your guilt. He's interested in you accepting the cross by way of your soul so that blood can wash over you. And when you accept, you stand up. Stand up. Don't listen to Satan another day. You stand up because your Lord said you're forgiven. The Lord said, you're the righteousness of Christ. The Lord said, you've been given power to become sons of God. The Lord said these things. Satan didn't say these things. The Lord said, you're no longer guilty. It is the old man that's guilty. The Lord separates you from the old and the new. The Lord does all these things. And that's what the gospel's all about. That's the good news. Upon that realization of how far we've fallen, there is restoration. There is a new you. And I'll tell you something, he already knows we need help. When the born-again spirit is granted, your desire for what you used to do will totally be gone. And he knows we need help from there. So he never leaves us nor forsakes us. But he keeps us very close to him. These are the processes of our Lord and Savior, granted to us by our Father, and they are real. And it takes almost a lifetime to come to that realization. So don't ever say, I wish I would have come to this realization sooner. No, nope. he had your timing in his hand. He appoints the timing. He does that. Man doesn't do that. The Father does. So stand up and hold your head up because you're in the fold. And the Lord's not looking at your faults. He's looking at his child. That's what it's all about, folks. Because Satan will have a person thinking that they have gone so low, there is no coming back. And do you know right now the suicide rate is pretty high? We have a job to do collectively. A real work we have to do because of more people we can authentically reach by way of the gospel. That's another life saved from darkness and it's all appointed but we have to be in position we have to be ready but right now we're in the era of grace and mercy with a lot of challenges and everything else but take don't take thought of your life your life is not yours you're bought with a price no one has the authority to take your life no thing has the authority to take your life you're bought with a price that was a communication to us meaning that at great value your life has been secured in the hands of the messiah and the price was everything God gave everything for your life. Do you know that? He gave everything for your life. Remember that. That's why Jesus said, I and the Father are one. I want you to think about something real quick, then we're going to move on. Jesus is the Word of God made flesh and dwelt among men. There is nothing comparable to the Word of God according to the living God. There's nothing comparable. God gave His Word up for you. He put his word to death, his sacred word that was above all things. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and nothing was made without the word. He took his most precious element, and he gave it up for you. That's the price he paid for you on an individual level. He gave it up for you. You mean everything to the Father. So don't ever think he's left your life to chance. You're bought with a price before you even came to this earth. You were bought with a price. I know that many people have not explained this to you, but if you read your Bibles, you're going to find out that people were written in the Lamb's Book of Life from the beginning of the world, from the foundations of the world. Likewise, there were some that were not written in the Book of Life from the foundation of the world. You have been secured. That's why you believe. That's why I keep saying you cannot believe in Jesus Christ in truth and not be his. The Lord said, all that come to me, the Father hath given me, and I will in no wise cast out, and I will raise him up at the last day. That's you. You've been bought with a price. There should be no question about that. God gave everything just for you. Think about that. No, we don't deserve it. But when you're, when you're working in the path of love, it's not based on deserving anything. It's based on love. That's the difference between human, this human definition of love people exercise in the world and real love. Only God can define love because God is love. You're going to make it because he loves you. He's the one that can fix your heart, that causes change. When you're running around and you say, I can't do that anymore. He did that. We didn't do that. He did that. Think about it. He's doing everything. He times all of these things in our lives. There's only one thing he does not do for us. He will not make a choice for us. But he will appoint the seasons of conviction, the seasons where you can see, the seasons of struggle and the seasons when there is no struggle. And he does so for 
you, not against you. Time for us to have some understanding of this because he gave everything just for you. So when you're standing in the face of absolute destruction, some of you, remember that he gave everything for you and everything in your life has been happening for you, not against you. It is designed perfectly for you, even among so many. That means he's working it out. All these things you worry about, you read about Martha. The Lord said, don't think about that stuff. Handle the issues of today. Do so with the Lord. Remember his promises. See, sometimes we handle issues and we forget the nature of his promises. We forget his great love. We forget that God gave everything for us. We act like castaways. In so doing, we start believing the words of Satan. So much so, we repeat them. When you accept defeat, you're repeating what Satan has told you, not what your father has told you. Your father never said you were defeated. He said, you shall have the victory. You will be lifted up. You will be delivered. You will be healed. That's what your father said. But Satan says you won't be healed, you won't be lifted up, and you won't have the victory. Satan is one that speaks to you when he tries to divide your family and break you up. And he says, see your family, but some of you don't even know it. That was never your family because you will never lose what truly belongs to you. What we did do in the beginning was grab some things in the earth that did not belong to us. And we have to do everything we can do to hold on to it. I'm going to tell you something. If something does not belong to you, you can do everything on this earth. You're not going to be able to hold it in your hand. Because the moment you fall asleep, it's going to fly away. But if something belongs to you, you can throw it as far as you can. It's always coming back. You can never lose what truly belongs to you. Half the things we have accumulated in this world are not ours. What truly belongs to you, you can never lose. So don't let Satan talk to you saying, oh, I've lost just so much. You've lost other folks' things and other things that were not yours. What the Lord has for you cannot be spoiled, tainted. It cannot rust think about it. We're going to wake up to these realizations, but I'll tell you something. If you can see the conflict in these statements, then you'll see the nature of the war. Part of the nature of the war is to get you to believe Satan over the words of Christ. It's to get you to accept that you'll never be much. To get you in a negative mindset. To believe that Jesus is somehow distant. In so doing, you believe against the word of God because he stands at the door and he knocks. Don't believe Satan. He has many strategies and plans. But I'll tell you something. The Lord said he would not have us ignorant concerning the devices of the enemy. He'll always put somebody in the body of Christ that knows what he's up to. I'm telling you right now, he's trying to get you to accept his words about the living gods. Don't believe Satan another day. If he so much as speaks against a promise that Jesus gave you and you read about, and you know the confirmation is in your heart, do not entertain the words of Satan another day. Stop waking up worrying about things that are going to fail. But you have an understanding. What belongs to Christ shall never be uprooted. But whatever the Father did not plant, it shall be uprooted. Be thankful for that. That there are things in our lives that God did not give us, nor did he put there, that will be pulled up and pulled away from you. You're being freed. You're not being limited. It's a beautiful story for the saints. One day, Revelation will be a book of promise to you, not a book of fear. You'll see beyond what causes the flesh to shake. The Lord will open your eyes to the beauty of it, and in that day you will rejoice. Your flesh is going to have a reaction to things that happen in the earth, but your spirit is not your flesh, and you are that spirit. You are not your flesh. The flesh is the old man, your old desires, the old things you used to do. It is the Lord that's bringing you into maturity. You're becoming one with that newness of spirit. So when he comes back and destroys all the works of iniquity and darkness, flesh will be destroyed, but not you. And that's a mystery. That's why you must be changed in a twinkling of an eye, because flesh and blood will never inherit the kingdom of God. You must not be flesh and blood when he comes, so you have to be changed. Should you be alive when he comes, you will be changed. The process will be expedient upon you. Until that time, you're being separated from the old man fully. You're being grown in the newness of a born-again spirit. You're in this world, not of this world, because that newness of spirit comes directly from the Most High, from the Creator, which is why your desires are different, which is why you see different, which is why you're, you're thinking differently than your family, which is why you see people still doing old things, and you said, no, they, they shouldn't do that. But you're growing into this newness. There's a whole knowledge base in the spirit that was never in your flesh. That's when your life becomes uncomplicated. And make no mistake, you live in the last moments of prophecy. You knew that when you were born. You knew that something else was going on beyond the comprehension 
of so many. Yes, you have concerns about things in your life, but you're supposed to cast those cares upon the Lord who's able to bear those burdens. You're not able to because what it's doing is causing you to cut off everybody else. It's making you bitter. It hasn't worked for years. Time for you to take those and give them to the Lord. Here's how you do that. You say, Lord, you're the only hope for this situation. If you don't work it out, that's going to be the end of me. So be it. I entrust you with it, Lord. You have to take that step where you put something in his hands that you really have to trust him with. We have a reserved trust and we have backup plans. Just in case the Lord does not fulfill one thing, we have a backup plan. Don't have a backup plan with Christ. That is not faith. That is testing. We're not here to test Christ, to see if he's going to work in a certain area. We're here to have faith in the word of the Lord and the word of the Lord is Christ. Not to test him, because if you test him, you're going to get test results. If you have faith in him, that's when your life changes. But you have to take that step. That's a scary step, isn't it? It's a scary step to put something in the whole hands of the Lord, to put that whole situation in his hands. It's scary to have no backup plan. I already told you I've been called stupid. I have no backup plan for life. Everything's vested in his lopsided. I'll tell you now, if it fails, I'm done for. It cannot operate. But that's in the Messiah's hand. Whatever he decides is how it's going to be. That's why I don't complain, whine, and cry about things. It's in his hands. He gave us a command to love one another. If he gave us a command to love one another, and if he's the one responsible for setting up trials and tribulations, then he would have every task that you do for someone done by way of love. So how would he do that? By making sure that love is the qualifier for you finishing every task he will give you. Well, how does the Lord do that? He'll have you in a position where you have to exhaust things personally to get things done so that you may only finish your task only by love. If he commanded that we love one another, then to finish a task of the Lord can be done no other way than by love, which will cost you a lot. You see, when you have to give up things, you can only continue by way of love. Love is the only qualifier that can bring you through something like that, where you have to give up everything when you don't benefit. Only by love can something be done that way. Many of you have been in predicaments and you don't understand why it's so challenging because the Lord called you to a task and his tasks are bound in love. So when you do something by love, it must be completed only by love itself, not by brains or talent, smarts or anything else, or it requires sacrifice. During the process of completing that task, you may be required to give up quite a bit, but you'll only complete it by way of love. When you do complete it by way of love, there are promises upon your life. So in this world, many of you have lost quite a bit, and you don't understand how another person can do it. And they keep skating through, not losing what you lost. But when you do it, your compassion is so high. But it's only by love you have gotten to a certain position. The Lord is qualifying your life that you finish the tasks he is giving you by way of love and no other way. I want you guys to understand that method that's upon your life. And you will eventually complete what he has sent you here to do by love itself. It can't be completed any other way. So you understand that. So you know that. And now that you know, it should give answer to quite a few things in your life. Even when you read the Bible, you're going to see this echoed over and over and over again. So don't think it's strange. When you face certain trials, you lose certain things in these tasks, these compassionate things that you do. To lose things does not mean you have lost. It means you're on your way. And when you do so, and love is established as that path, you're certainly on the path of righteousness. That's all I got for you, folks. I really hope that helps you understand certain aspects of your life. Folks, let's press on. Love will lead the way. It always has. And remember, the Lord said he'll finish the work he began in you. That's love itself. God is love. Love will finish this. God bless and keep all of you always. We'll see you guys next time right here on COT.